All right, Ken. Um, you sure take your time between each soul album. I mean, it's been <laughs> like 20 years. Yeah, that is rather a long time, isn't it? Yeah, I'm actually, um, I've been very busy in that 20 years, but uh, uh, it took a long time for me to get myself back together again after Uriah Heep and get my life together and get my feet on the ground. And then I did an album in 1999, which I just released on the website. And that was what gave me the idea to do a serious commercial album. And because I write all the time, I had plenty of songs to choose from. So I just felt like it was the right time to do it. And so I gave up my cushy little job in, in St. Louis and uh, everything that went with it and said, let's go on the road. Uh, have you been writing material ever since you left your hip? Yes, um, I write pretty much all the time. Um, I, I don't necessarily finish songs as I go along, but I, I, I'm always writing down ideas, and then when I have time, I just take those ideas and piece them together. So I write continuously. I used to do that in Uriah Heap, obviously, because we released albums every like nine or ten months. I mean, that was <laughs> that was a, a, a lot of demand, but uh, I learned how to do it then, and, and so it's fairly easy for me to continue doing it. So, uh, some of the riffs and songs on your new solo album, uh, Running Blind, they are quite old. That's true. Uh, there's a song in there from 1978, uh, the Little Piece of Me, the song that was written right after my daughter Julia was born. There's a song in there from 1982, which I wrote when I was kind of retired in Colorado. And yeah, it spans the whole, whole time, really, since I left Uriah Heap until now. And there are songs that were written just two weeks before the album was finished. So, so uh, you should have uh, plenty of material for, for your next solo album then. It shouldn't take 20 more years <laughs> before <laughs> that will be released. No, we're actually planning to record in November. Um, uh, this obviously, Free Spirit is a brand new band, uh, and, but it's working very well. And I'd like to record a whole album using this particular band so at the moment uh, in our schedule for planning we've got November set aside to record the next album we're also going to be doing some live recording uh, during the UK tour next month and uh, so we'll have lots of stuff uh, you released a live album last year with uh, John Lawton uh, uh, what happened between the two of you as far as I understand you, you kind of broke up was there a disagreement or oh yeah there was um a serious disagreement. I mean, we didn't disagree on stage at all. I mean, everything on stage was working fine. Essentially, what we did was we took John's band and I kind of joined that um, to, to make it easier to tour and everything. But the differences really between John and I were not really musical. They weren't anything to do with the performances because they were always really good. The differences were in just the way we operate. Um, the small, the little things between shows, um, the logistical issues, the staff issues, you know, it, it was really um, a whole bunch of different things which reflected the difference in our approach. And um, I, I would not accept John's approach to it and he wouldn't accept mine. So at the end of those shows, we just sat down and decided to finish it before our friendship was affected by it. We chose to keep our friendship and let the other thing go away. It was the right. It was the right decision. Uh, well, let's look a bit back. I mean, after you left Rahib, you, you joined Blackfoot for a while, and then you left Blackfoot. Uh, what did you do after that? Well, I, I I left Blackfoot in the middle of a tour. Actually, I got a call from London saying that David Byron had died. That was I think eighty three or eighty four. Um, Blackfoot was fun, but it wasn't right for me. I mean, it's a different style of music and a different style of living, which I didn't like. Um, and so I basically retired. I decided when I got the call that said that David had, had died, I took a long, hard think about my life and myself and everything and um, decided to to sort of back away from touring uh, and kind of review what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and um, I went into business in St. Louis where I was living in America and... Uh, learned a lot about the commercial side of the music business and um, I opened a studio there uh, which is still there and it's doing quite well and um, that kept me busy and um, took a lot of time and money to do that but I was glad I did that and then 97 I started recording with some friends which resulted in the album A Glimpse of Glory 
Um, and then, like I said, 1999, I immediately started work on Running Blind. So um, I wasn't doing nothing, but I really wanted to, a chance to stand back. To be honest with you, there were so many demons in my life when I left Uriah Heap that I really had to get rid of all of them. I was badly addicted to cocaine, and I had to get rid of that, and thank God I did. Um, and I really just wanted to rediscover myself. I was completely lost in this machine that was called Uriah Heap, and I needed to rediscover myself. So I thought it would take a few years, but it took a few years longer. <laughs> you, you're on a new solo album. Uh, if you compare that to what you did with uh, Uriah Heap and maybe also your, your first solo album, uh, what would you say about that? Well, I think that's the best comparison. I think there's uh, a lot of similarities in terms of style between this and my first one, Proud Words on a Dusty Shelf. I think you're right about that. Uh, and I think the similarities to Uriah Heap come from the fact that my style was really finalized and developed and established during my time with Uriah Heap. By about the time we recorded Look at Yourself and Demons and Wizards, that I had pretty much settled into a, a style of working that I was really comfortable with and a style of production which may seem a little old-fashioned to some people, but... You know, I only use analog equipment and so on and so forth, but um, that's just where I'm comfortable. And I think that's, in a way, Stig, I think that's what people expect me to do. I, th I think that you make, it's wonderful to experiment, and I do experiment, but the, I think there's a risk involved in that when you have an established audience, such as Uriah Heap does and such as I do to some extent, I don't think you can go too far away from what they expect, otherwise you give them a nasty surprise. So I've really stayed within certain production and, and recording and musical guidelines, not just for my own comfort, but also for the comfort of the people that are going to buy the, buy the music. Uh, on, on this album, you, you do the vocals, uh, you play the guitars, uh, of course you, you play organ. Um, who's in your band now and, and what do you do on stage? Do you play both guitar and organ? Um, I've got myself a great band. I'm really, really... Very lucky to have these guys. Uh, my guitar player is named Dave Kilminster. Uh, my bass player is Andy Pyle, who most people will know from Wishbone Ash, Gary Moore, B.B. Uh, King. Um, and my bass player is uh, the youngest guy in the band, Pete Riley. There's just four of us, but we make a huge sound for some reason. I don't. It fits very well. And yes, I play B3 and Mini Moog and uh, Synthesizer and... Um, I also play acoustic and electric guitar during the show. The show consists of um, a look back, obviously, to songs I wrote for Uriah Heap, the best-known songs that I wrote for Uriah Heap, plus a, a really good look at Running Blind. Um, do you still keep in touch w with the guys in Uriah Heap? Yes, I do. As a matter of fact, I played with them in December at a, a big uh, celebration in London, which was fun. I had not played with them for 20, 21 years, I think. <laughs> it was a lot of fun to relearn those songs. Um, and, uh, yeah, we stay in touch quite regularly. Mick and I are in touch a lot. And uh, Lee and I stay in touch um, fairly regularly, yeah. Have you been listening to the albums that they've done after you left the band? Um, yeah, I have. Um, you know, I've been reading about them and I was given copies of them and I listened to them, yeah. Are you going to ask me to say something about them? <laughs> Well, it's awfully difficult for me to comment because, you see, my view of Uriah Heap is Gary Thane, Lee Kerslake, David Byron, Mick Box and me. Sort of the 73 through 76 years, or 72 through 76 years. And it's, so, so it's awfully difficult to listen objectively to what they're doing now or what they've done recently because I obviously make a comparison between that and 72 through 76, and there is no comparison. Um, I mean, the guys make decent, you know, pop rock records, but what they seem to lack, in my opinion, is songs. I don't, I don't think they've got the strong songs they need to establish the new lineup as a replacement for the old lineup, which is why when they play, people expect them to play the old songs. So it's a very difficult transition to make from an identity that's so clearly defined and established by about six to eight songs. Uh, unless you can replace that or rearrange that identity with six to eight new ones. And I think if it lacks one thing, I think what it lacks right now is songs. In the beginning of the 80s, you became a Christian. Yep. Um, did that affect your your, um, your music and, and your, your lyrics? Well, um, it was actually in April of 1993. 1993. And I... Uh, 
Yes, it did. I mean, A Glimpse of Glory, the CD which I recorded in 97, um, is essentially a, a Christian album. And, and the difference is that the style is pretty much the same, but the difference is mainly in the lyrical content. Um, but I don't want to confuse people by um, mixing messages within the context of an album. So I've chosen to keep all of my uh, Christian, my faith-based songs separate. And so we'll be uh, releasing, we are releasing a new version of uh, Glimpse of Glory with new Christian songs on it. Uh, but I've, I also believe that my, my becoming a Christian was a personal choice. Um, I'm not one of those people that goes out and preaches to people and says, you know, you almost do the same as what I'm doing or whatever. I'm not an American evangelist. I just, uh, I just have a great, a strong faith and it's helped me in everything. And, um, I'm really grateful to people, especially the fans that have accepted that it was just my personal choice. And it has made a difference to my entire life. So, of course, the influence of that faith finds its way into everything I do, um, whether it's performing or traveling or writing or singing. You know, everything is affected by that because it involves a change in your heart. And I believe I'm a much, actually a much better person, easier person to be around now than I used to be. <laughs> Um, who are, are coming to your shows now? I'm sure uh, the old Eurahip fans are, are there. Um, do you think that um, new fans are, are coming uh, along, uh, that people are discovering you still? Yeah, it, it is interesting, and the discovery is taking place within an interesting age group. It's like 15, 16, 17-year-olds are coming with their parents <laughs> to shows. And thank God it's not their grandparents yet, but... Um, for example, I mean, I, we were in the, the ferry terminal in Turku waiting to go over to Stockholm about a week ago. And I had been in Russia doing promotion for Running Blind. And there was a the Russian girls uh, football team was there in the area. And they all came over because they had a picture of me in the in a magazine article. And, you know, so it was pretty cool, you know, taking pictures with 60. I'd love to have that audience. But I'm finding, yeah, there are more young people coming. And... Um, I'm hoping that because we've worked hard to get Running Blind distributed properly in all the major markets, that if we get the kind of airplay that we want with the singles that we're releasing, then maybe people come out of curiosity. And if we can get them through the door, we know we can do the job in terms of helping them to enjoy what we're doing. So this is an investment, really, in time and energy because um, I'm thinking long-term about it, and I'd love to see us broaden the audience beyond the hardcore Uriah Heap fans and Ken Ainsley fans. Uh, our very special guest uh, today I shouldn't need any further introduction. Uh, Ken Hensley, it's an honor to have you on the show. Uh, how are you doing these days? I'm doing fine. I have a little bit of a sore throat, but that's from singing too loud. <laughs> You have uh, picked up the music we'll be playing uh, this hour. Uh, I guess you just have picked your, your own favorites from a uh, long time back? Um, I picked ten of them because um, I could actually pick hundreds and thousands. Um, I've been alive for a long time, so obviously <laughs> I've, I've listened to a lot of music. and um, So I picked these ten songs because they each one of them has a special meaning um, in one way or another uh, some funny reasons and some more serious reasons but each one of them has a little story that goes with it so I picked these ten mm. specifically for that reason Smoke on the Water is not only one of my favourite tracks but the live version of it is um, it's got so much power and so much energy and when we used to have parties at my house you know, invariably people start talking and everything else we're playing music and they start talking so whenever this was on I didn't allow any talking and if people kept talking I just kept turning the volume up until it got so loud they left the room so that's always been one of my favorites mm. this was uh, well of course we talked the 70s here and uh, you played in Urahip at that time uh, both Deep Purple and Urahip big bands uh, did you know the guys in, in Deep Purple oh yeah we knew them very well we um, a little piece of history is that Deep Purple and Uriah Heep, we, we rehearsed in the same place, mm. in the west of London. And um, <laughs> we were both playing extremely loud. We could hear each other very clearly. No, we got to know them quite well. We toured with them in Europe and also in America. And um, so, yeah, we got to know them pretty well. And they were all good guys. We were great guys and never any problems when we were on the road. 
mm. unlike with some bands there was never any big ego problems or anything so they were they were cool guys and they still are I worked with Ian Gillen last year uh, up in St. Petersburg Russia on a a, a festival and that was a lot of fun so it's, we have so many stories that we could be there for days <laughs> your <coughs> keyboards was uh, kind of a trademark for uh, your eye hip and also uh, John Lord's uh, keyboards uh, used to be a trademark for, for Deep Purple and have you been discussing keyboard playing with him? well mm, no I mean the, the thing about it is that um, John and like Keith Emerson Rick Wakeman and guys like that are um really great keyboard players um, but they're trained and they know how to do everything properly I don't know anything about that all I know is um, how to try to create the sound I hear in my head I never learned how to play instruments properly because my main reason for learning to play instruments was because I wanted to turn my poems into songs so everything I do with guitar and keyboards is completely unorthodox it's not right it works out okay <laughs> but <laughs> technically and, and formally it's not right but that's good in another sense that it's given me my own technique which nobody can copy because they don't know how to do it <laughs> um, so I don't I don't talk about keyboard playing much I talk a lot about keyboards with other keyboard players because the Hammond is such a special instrument uh, and they don't make them anymore and it's so or at least the original valve versions um, and there are so many great keyboards on the market that as soon as a new one comes out I'll get a call from somebody and say hey have you tried this and have you tried that that's good to share that information but my needs are very simple hmm. do you play both keyboards and the guitar these days on stage or yeah I play um, Hammond uh, I have one synthesizer that I carry with me uh, mainly for strings and piano uh, and I also play acoustic guitar and, and electric guitar on stage this was a, a, a live track. Uh, how do you look up on uh, live albums compared to, to studio albums? Well, there are some good live albums out there, and, and in, in some cases, I think some um, <coughs> live albums are actually better than some studio albums. I think our live album that we released in 73 or 72, whenever it was, uh, I still listen to that one because it's a clean album, it's got lots of energy, uh, and it's very valid there are some live albums that are so obviously not live albums but just studio albums with audience sounds uh, attached to them that uh, I don't listen to those but um, my favorite videos are live videos I don't like um, drama videos for um, bands but um, there's there's virtue in both but to do a good live album you have to have a very very solid band very consistent band and then you have to have the right facilities for recording and you also have to forget that you're making a live record you have to just do a normal show just like we did in Birmingham you have to basically just put it out of your head otherwise you, you're focusing on the wrong things if you focus on just doing a normal show you end up with a great live record so you actually just recorded that uh, only concert for, for uh, the record we actually recorded several shows before that but the recordings weren't good and we felt going into that show that we wouldn't make a live record we uh, were disappointed by that and then we walked into Birmingham it was the last um, show on the tour and the last one that we were going to record and um, we walked in there in the afternoon and the acoustics were so terrible we felt certain we wouldn't make a record there but they recorded it anyway but by then we had completely forgotten it we had to, uh, abandoned the whole idea because we were sure that the results would be terrible and as a result we had a great show and the sound was great so there you go <laughs> Okay, that was uh, CC Top uh, and Legs from the Eliminator album. Uh, you actually picked 
two songs of that record. Uh, you must be a huge uh, CZ Top fan then. I am, um, mainly because I just love their attitude. Um, they don't generally cave into the business. They're not business guys. They're just musicians that got lucky and they just have a great time. You can see it in their videos. You can see it in their attitude. We did a lot of shows with them on tour in America and um, they were always just completely off the wall. Uh, they improved a lot when Frank uh, got off of heroin. And uh, this, this album, Eliminate, I could have picked the whole album because I just love to listen to it. But it's like everything else in this genre of music. I, lo I love to listen to it really loud. Mm. Uh, do you still listen to their new music? I mean, they still release albums. Yeah, I, I haven't really... Um, I don't get given records anymore like I used to, <laughs> so I don't, I don't buy many CDs. I've bought two CDs in the last three years, and both of them were really disappointing, so I, I don't actually um, buy them. And I live in Spain, too, which is not ZZ Top's biggest market, <laughs> so um, I'm not exposed to it. So I still play the old stuff. I guess it's just on safe territory. Hmm. Uh, the next track is Give Me All Your Love, and... and uh uh, you want the album version, not the single version. What's the difference? On the original album, and I don't even know if that's still available, but on the original, original record, um, there are no harmony vocals on this song. On the single version and the video, there are, because I guess Warner Brothers put pressure on them to make it a little more commercial by adding some um, um, harmony vocals, and I'm, I'm really surprised that they did that. Uh, but they did... And I don't like it as much. I like the raw version of the original record, so hopefully everybody else will like it too. Okay, let's check it out.